Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Coffee with Leaders session with Rich Tivini. And uh, I'm Gunjan Agarwal, co-founder of Learn with Leaders. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, morning, evening, afternoon to all the different time zones that we are in right now. A few rules for the session. I would love for all of you to switch on your video if your network permits. Uh, also, if you can add your school name after your name. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, just uh, put it in the chat and we'll do it for you. Uh, third, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand. Uh, and while, uh, you know, Rich is speaking, be nice if you can be on mute so there is less background noise. Uh, okay, so welcome everyone. Here's a quick introduction of Rich. He is an ex-Navy SEAL officer and author of an amazing book called The Attributes. Uh, somebody who's completely brilliant. I've enjoyed my conversations with him in the past. He talks very deeply about self-awareness and finding who we are. Uh, I've already learned a lot, you know, just interacting with him. Uh, so I'll keep this short. Uh, Rich, over to you. Well, thank you. Th thanks so much for having me. And it's wonderful to be here with all of you um, around the world, which is cool because I'm on the East Coast of the United States. So it's nice to talk to everybody around the world. Um, you know, I, I'm excited to kind of talk to you all because I think about my own journey uh, and the idea that I kind of, I grew up in Connecticut in the States and I, I had a very kind of, um, you know, average, normal uh, upbringing. You know, there's nothing really special uh, about it. I have um, a twin brother and I have an older sister and a younger brother, so, so four of us. And, um, and I, you know, I wanted to be, my, my brother and I wanted to be pilots um, because my dad was a pilot. Uh, you know, f uh, flying privately, and we kind of fl fell in love with flying, and we said, "Well, let's be jet pilots." You know, so we decided we wanted to be jet pilots, and of course, the the Navy in the U.S. Navy, uh, you all probably know that they, they they land their jets on ships, which is kind of cool. And so, <laughs> and so my brother and I said, "Well, let's do that." You know, and um, and that was really kind of our 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 goal from very early on, and we kind of we focused on that and kind of moved towards that. And it wasn't until the early 90s that I found out about Navy SEALs. And for those of you who might not know, I mean, Navy SEALs are the the U.S. Navy's version of special operations troops. So they kind of commandos, if you will. Um, and I know they're they're very they're they're very well known now. They weren't very well known back in the in the 90s. But um, but I started reading about them and researching them. And, and it seemed like they were pretty cool. And it was a really kind of difficult um pathway uh because, because the training is known as some of the hardest train in the world and i i really wanted to i was i wondered if i could do it you know and i said to myself you know i don't want to be a pilot and wonder if i could be a, a seal and so that's why i chose that pathway and um and worked hard and ended up going to seal training and made it through um and for those of you who you know, might not know i mean navy seal training it's about uh, uh an 80 nine or an 89 percent attrition rate which means um out of 100 people who try out only about 11 make it through right so my class for example when we started had 160 people in it when we started and we graduated 38 uh so so that, that gives you a sense of of the difficulty um but i made it through and i spent about 21 years in the seal teams and of course through the you know between 1996 and 2017 when i retired there was a lot of activity. So I learned a lot and I got a chance to um, run SEAL training. So then I got a chance to see the other side of SEAL training and, and taught me about these these innate qualities, you know, the, these the, these qualities that drive our behavior. You know, all of us are so often focused on skills um, and kind of those things that we can do. Um, and and skills don't necessarily drive our, our behavior. They tell us they tell us what to do in specific situations, right? So so let me just give you an example. Uh, skills are learned, right? None of us are born with the ability to, to throw a ball or, or ride a bike or anything like that. Um, they tell us what to do in specific situations. So here's how and when to throw a ball or ride a bike. Um, and then because they're, uh, they're specific and you can see them, they're very easy to assess, measure, and test, right? It's very easy. You can, you can see how well someone does any one of those things, riding a bike or shooting it or, or, or throwing, a, uh, throwing a ball. The problem with skills is skills don't necessarily tell us how we're going to behave in times of stress and challenge and uncertainty. When when we don't, when the environment becomes tough and uncertain, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to apply a known skill. This is when we lean our, on our attributes. Our attributes are innate qualities. We're all born with 
levels of patience and resilience and adaptability. Okay. Um, certainly they develop over time, but, but we, all of us have at least level, we can see levels of this in small children, right? So we all have these things. They inform our behavior rather than they dictate our behavior, right? So they, they tell us how we're going to show up. Uh, all of our levels of resilience and perseverance, for example, uh, informed the way we showed up when we were riding up, uh, learning how to ride a bike the very first time, and we were falling off a dozen times doing so. And then because they're hard to see, they're hard to assess, measure, and test. It's very difficult to see how much adaptability someone has. The, the times where we see this stuff is, is, is during times of challenge, uncertainty, and stress. When things get tough is when our attributes kind of come to the fore. So the book really describes these attributes instead and, and kind of helps change the focus on skill. And skills are, again, you know, getting, you know, the, 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 the A in school is, is largely a skill, but it's, it's a measure of something. Okay. It's, it tells us something about skills. It's not, it's not necessarily tell us a lot about our attributes other than the amount of work you put into study to get that A. That starts telling us about the attributes. So the idea here, the idea of the, the, idea of the book and the idea of this talk this morning is to talk to you all about the fact that we are all human beings, right? So we're all the same that way. But um, you can think of us as kind of automobiles, okay? Some of us are Jeeps and some of us are Ferraris and some of us are SUVs, all right? Now there's no judgment there because the Jeep can do things the Ferrari can't do and the Ferrari can do things the Jeep can't do, okay? The, the, key, the trick is, the key is to start to lift our own hood and see what type of engine we are because if we start to understand ourselves, we start to understand what track <clears throat> is gonna be best for our, for our, uh, uh, our performance and our success, right? If you're a Jeep trying to run on a Ferrari track, it may be a lot tougher <laughs> for you, right? Than, uh, than if you're a Jeep running on a Jeep track. So, so what I wanna kind of talk to you about and we're gonna kind of have a conversation about this morning is are these attributes and we'll, we'll dive into some of them, but, but really want you to think about in terms of your own performance, there's no judgment on where we show up. For, so let me, let me just kind of baseline this. All of us have all of the attributes, okay? The difference in each one of us are the levels to which we have each attribute. So for example, adaptability out of a one to 10, 10 being high, I might be a level eight on adaptability, which means when the environment changes around me without my control, it's fairly easy for me to kind of go with the flow. All right. Someone else might be a level three, which means when the environment changes around them without their control, it's tough for them to go with the flow. It's tough for them to adapt. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. All right. Um, the idea is, you know, where do I fall on these attributes so that if there's one that I actually want to develop a little bit more, <clears throat> I know I can develop it and you can develop an attribute. You're not, it's not fixed, right? It just, it takes a lot more work than learning a skill, all right? To develop an attribute, it takes self-motivation, self-direction, and then it takes a willingness on that person's part to step deliberately into discomfort to test and tease that attribute out, right? So if you, if any of you said, I want to develop my patience, for example, <clears throat> you would then have to find environments and situations that you could step into that tested your patience so you could develop that more actively. I can't teach you a class on patience like I could teach you a class on a skill. Okay. So, so if that makes sense, hopefully that makes sense. So the idea here is start to understand your own, your own engine and then start to be proud of your own engine. Okay. Because, because we're all different. Um, and then, and then say to yourself, okay, with this engine, what can I actually really excel and succeed at? And maybe what are the attributes that I want to work on uh, a little more of, All right? So that's kind of the overall concept. I'll stop there and and um, we'll, we'll get into some topics or questions or good, and we can talk about whatever, we can go whatever direction we want to. Yes, absolutely, uh, Rich. So first, I think I like to ask these students if any of them have any prepared questions uh, from what they've researched. And uh, you could raise your hands and we'll go one by one. How about uh, Elsa? Hi. Um, Hi. Well, I just started reading the chapter yesterday. It's really interesting. Um, it's not really a question, but it's like, um, I like how clear your writing is. I feel like it's very easy to follow. And it always goes back to that initial story about um, that guy that was rejected, but not because of him, but just because he wasn't, he didn't have the right attributes. So I thought it was a great start to the book. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And the, and the, the fact that it, it reads so, um, so well and easily for you really it makes me feel good because I tried to write it in a way that uh, was relatable. You know, sometimes it's tough for um, people to 
talk about experiences they had, especially maybe extreme experiences like the Navy SEALs <laughs> and get it and, re and have it relate to everybody, right? So, so if it relates, if we can, if I can explain it in a way that relates and you can say, hey, this kind of, I can take this concept and put it, plug it into my own life, that really, that really makes me feel good. So thank you for, for starting to read it. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Um, and thanks yeah. for, for your compliment. Thanks, Elsa. Annie, you're going to go next. Hi. Hi. So I was having a conversation with one of my friends the other day about the attributes book. And it was really interesting because she was kind of like asking about the kind of nature of attributes in itself. Do you think that maybe some attributes come from us innately and some are maybe a result of our environments from how we grew up? Yeah, yeah, Annie. What a great question. I, and I do think it's both. I really do. Now, I would say, and I, and we'd have to ask some some psychologists probably. <laughs> I don't. I'm not a psychologist. Okay. Um, my sense is that we all we all start with um, with kind of a genetic template of where we stand. And and the reason why I say this is because you know, and I have kids, but anybody who sees small kids can see that it's very easy sometimes to see a small kid, even a one year old, and say that that kid is not patient at all. That that kid is an impatient kid, or that kid is a very patient kid. So some of these attributes are, they're kind of they're kind of baked into us. But that said, um, environment certainly can help develop attributes. Um, I would say that uh, that if it's a repeated development process, even someone who's a little bit lower. So let's just take adaptability. Um, a kid could be uh, low on adaptability, right? <clears throat> but then they could be in a military family, for example, in the US. <clears throat> military families in the US tend to move around a lot, right? So <clears throat> they go from base to base. That kid in their growing up process will have to move several times and will likely develop some adaptability just through that process, right? Um, even if they were low on adaptability, but that's not always the case. That person might be lower on adaptability and that means every time they move, it's pretty hard, okay? Um, so I do think that environment matters. The other, thing, the other way I think we should think about environment and why it matters is that we sometimes have what I call dormant attributes, okay? A dormant attribute are, is an attribute that we have a lot of, but we don't know it because we've never been put into a position where it's been tested, okay? Um, and that's just, it, it's just a matter of the environment, right? You know, I, there was a lot of attributes that, I, that were never tested in me because I had a very normal, nice childhood. I didn't have a lot of things happen to me that would test it, <laughs> tested my attributes. SEAL training was one of the toughest things I've ever I had ever done up to that point. So, so sometimes those tests come early in our lives and sometimes they come later. And sometimes we have to deliberately put ourselves into uh, discomfort so that we can test that. But, um, but I would definitely agree. I would never, I would never say that it's only one or the other. Um, and no matter where we start environment, definitely are, are, are ways we can either tease them out or develop them if we want to. Thanks, Rich. Annie, also, could you just quickly introduce yourself? So any student asking a question, please say your name, school, and where you, where you are from. Um, my name is Annie Ruan. I'm from Charles P. Allen, which is here in Nova Scotia, Canada. Thank oh, very you. nice. Great. Thank you. Ari, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rich, for your speech, first of all. Uh, I would like to ask you about, uh, you uh, mentioned we should be proud of our own engines and we should own it up. Uh, but I was wondering how, I, in this world we're living in, how can we differentiate our own engines to be better equipped for the future and for the world to make a change and uh, be successful and reach our aim? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And, um, and yes, uh, so first be proud of who we are, be proud of how we show up and recognize that our engines are unique, okay? Which, which means, again, I love the automobile analogy because it's easy to understand, certainly easy for me to explain. Um, every one of us, because of the makeup of our engine, is going to be capable of very unique things. Okay, so so when you ask about how we make our change, how we make our impact, one of our one of I think one of the things I think our responsibility is as human beings is to understand and start to figure out what are those unique qualities, so that we can then use them in the world. Okay, because we need what you have. We you know the world needs what you have specifically. Okay, and what what each one of you has, the world needs. Um, 
I can't tell you that, nor can anybody else, right? I think the problem a lot of times that we all face in today's world with social media and so much globalization is that we're given we're given images and examples on social media of what, what sometimes we think we need to be or think we need to live up to, okay? And just know that's an illusion, okay? There's no, there's, you know, no one else, you know, everybody's path is different. And just because someone is posting about, you know, sunbathing with a margarita every day, okay, that doesn't need to be us. And, and that's not a good standard for us to, <laughs> to, to, to aspire to. If, if we eventually get there, that's fine. You know, sunbathing with a margarita once in a while is fine, okay? But the key is don't let, don't try not to let other, all these other um, images and influences uh, make you judge who you are in yourself. Understand that, hey, I am, I'm here, I'm unique, I, have, I can make an impact on the world. One of the best ways you can start to figure that out is to ask yourself some good questions. So let me just give you a tip here. Our brains are designed to answer questions, okay? That's what our brains do. Oftentimes we do that unconsciously, okay? Our brains look at, you know, our brains look at a coffee mug and it bounces off a hippocampus and says, okay, that's a coffee mug. I know, what is that? It's a coffee mug. I've seen it before. Okay, got it. That happens in milliseconds. If we consciously ask ourselves a question, in, in other words, consciously lodge, our, lodge a question into our frontal lobe, our brain has no choice but to answer that question, to start coming up with answers, okay? We do this all the time. Unfortunately, we, we often do it the wrong way. We, we ask ourselves the wrong questions, okay? We say things like, why am I so bad at this? You know, why does this stuff always happen to me? Um, why is everybody again, out, out to get me, right? When, as soon as we ask that question, our brain begins to give us answers, all right? And I guarantee you those answers aren't gonna be empowering <laughs> and they're not, gonna, they're not gonna get you, they're not gonna take you forward, all right? I learned this technique when I was your age, when I was in high school, and I started asking my deliberately asking myself better questions constantly. I said, I said things like, what can I learn about this? What am I good at? How can I contribute? Who's out there who can help me? Okay. As soon as you lodge those questions, your brain starts to answer those questions too. And those questions are going to be much, much more empowering and much, much more productive. I am convinced, okay, based on, you know, just experience and just seeing this, you know, just seeing it play out that the quality of a lot of our lives is directly proportional to the quality of questions we consistently ask ourselves. All right. So in terms of figuring out your place, figuring out your contribution, start by taking control of the questions you ask yourself on a daily basis. And you do this, you do this all the time, really be diligent about it. Okay. Because, because it really affects the way we see the world. If for example, you don't know what question to ask. Okay. Cause I get that question as well. Hey, what do I ask? Ask this question what is a better question right now <laughs> all right and you will start to come up with better questions all right if you feel depressed if you feel uh down about you know and, and low okay ask yourself this question what am i grateful for right now all right because gratitude is going to generate some biochemistry and neurochemistry that's going to make you feel great all right and it'll help you put you in the right mo um, um, uh, mindset to ask the right questions so so hopefully those are some tips but you are unique. You there's a contribution you have to give to the world. It's on you to figure that out. You can start by taking control of the questions you ask yourself. Sorry, does that answer your question? And I, I I don't know if you meant to also ask that. How do you really find your true engine? Is that also something you were trying to ask? Uh, I think that's probably a part of the discovery of your strengths. And I think what Rich mentioned is very important. Uh, as a mother, I can tell you, I've been practicing this with my kids. Uh, gratitude uh, can be life changing. And I know it sounds like really you're telling me to say thank you. And I am telling you to say thank you. And you know, it is as basic as saying thank you for a cup of coffee to saying thank you for the air you breathe or you know what you have. Uh, because I think uh, while we are in school, we get so peer pressurized that our brain starts looking at everything negative in our life. You know, what is wrong with us rather than what is right with us. Mm -hmm. And if you start focusing on what's right, as Rich mentioned, your brain will automatically ask those right questions then. Yeah. And just know, by the way, for everybody to feel, feel okay about this, the reason why we tend to focus on what's wrong is because biologically, we are designed with a survival mechanism, okay? And so as, as humans, um, you know, just evolving, we are designed to notice threats to our survival, okay? So for example, back in the day when we were, you know, in the wilderness, uh, living in caves and the threat was, 
you know, saber toothed tiger or whatever it is, you know, or tiger or, or big, big animals. Um, we would in the middle of a field while picking berries, you know, suddenly like notice if there was a threat. Okay. So this is exactly why if we're walking by a newsstand and there are two newspapers next to each other and one says, um, uh, brilliant youth wins global spelling bee, which is a wonderful story. And the next one says, you know, uh, a dangerous storm headed our direction, we're going to gravitate towards the dangerous storm headline, okay, because it's a it's a survival thing. So, so just know that that's something we have to actively try not to do. Uh, because because that's why sometimes we focus on what's wrong, and the negative. Um, but we're in a we're in a world right now where fortunately, uh, most of us are in you know, a lot of the survival stuff we don't have to worry about. Okay, we can actually take a time, take time to um, to deliberately ignore some of the bad stuff, right, and focus on the good stuff. So it takes it takes deliberacy. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Ari. Uh, Shriya, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so my question is, what made you think that the Navy SEAL was the right thing for you, and how did you know you had the attributes to go through with it? Well, great question. Um, uh, the answer to both of those is I didn't. <laughs> I didn't know. And I was uncertain. It, for me, going the Navy SEAL route was a deliberate step into uncertainty. I had no clue. And when I got there, it was tough. Um, uh, but I chose, I think, so it, I think one of the ways that we grow as human beings and learn is that we have to oftentimes deliberately step out of our comfort zone into things that are difficult and challenging into the unknown okay um because that's how we understand that's how we start to learn about ourselves if you think about um you know if you think about our potential you know uh think about it kind of a, as a ring around us and at the edge of that ring is a is an edge right you know that's that's the end it's the horizon okay to get out to that edge, to walk out there is going to take a step into uncertainty and discomfort. Okay. And then we're going to get to that edge and we're going to realize, oh, wow, I did it. Okay. And what happens if you, if you're looking at a horizon, for example, and you say, okay, I'm going to go to that horizon and you move to the horizon that you were just looking at, what happens? The next horizon shows up, right? The horizon's always in front of you. You can always see the next thing. So once you get to your, your edge, you then see the next edge. And then you can walk out to that one, okay? And then you get to that one and you see the next one, okay? But every time you're making those steps, it's going to take some, um, it's gonna be scary. It's gonna, it's gonna be, it's gonna take some courage, okay? Because that, because it's, you're stepping into fear. So, you know, I know we wanted to talk about courage. Let's just talk about courage for a second. Courage, neurolo we're neurologically designed as human beings to actually step into our fear. And here's why. Um, our brains, you, you, our brains have an amygdala in, in, you know, our brains have an amygdala a threat detector. Okay. We've all heard about this threat detector and the amygdala response. And, and when we start getting afraid, we kind of start to teeter between two choices, right? The fight choice or flight. When we decide as humans to step into our fear, the fight, when we decide to fight, okay, which is step into our fear, um, a, a, a specific switch in our brain clicks. Okay. It, it, it flips. And when we when that when that switch flips, we get a dopamine reward. Okay, dopamine is a very powerful neurotransmitter. It tells our body and our physiology and our brains, "This is good. Keep going." It's actually the it's the foundation of most addictive behaviors. Okay, Mo uh, almost all addictive behaviors, whether it's smoking or drugs or drinking, whatever it is, they it 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 hyper initiates that dopamine response. It says, "Hey, this feels great." Right. Well, we also get that same dopamine when we step into what scares us, when we step into our fear, when we decide to fight. Now, this is by evolutionary design. Why? Because as human beings, we're designed to explore. We're designed to discover. We're designed to go out and find new shelter, new food. Okay, it's what's this, this specific neurological switch is what's taken human beings from cave dwellers to space explorers. All right. This, and we can, act, we can access, we can activate this. And this is not just when you reach your goal. Okay, every time you take a step into discomfort, into your fear, right, you will be rewarded. All right. So, Start to embrace fear and and um, and those things that are uncomfortable with this idea in mind. And don't you don't have to start extreme. None of you have to go to SEAL training right away. <laughs> All right. None of you have to go skydiving tomorrow. Right. But start thinking about those things that might make you a little nervous, might make you a little uncomfortable. 
um, and start at, you know, maybe actively taking a step into discomfort and feeling how good it feels and then doing it again. All right. So, so that's kind of a, a, a trick, um, to, to kind of stepping out to our edges and exploring our potential and growing as human beings. Thanks, Rich. Uh, Shri, does it answer your question? Yes, thank you. Antara Me. Uh, yes. Uh, my question is, what role do you prefer to play in working as part of a team and why? Okay, what, what, what role do I prefer to play in working part of a team? Um, let's see. So, so I think um, in, in a truly high performing team, I think it's our responsibility as a team member to play whatever role is required for us to play at the, in that moment. Okay. So, so part of a team, the, the, the way the, 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 the best teams operate in a truly trusted environment. Okay. And what that means is every team member um, is vulnerable and transparent, not just about their weaknesses, but also about their strengths. Okay. So in other words, on a SEAL team, for example, um, all of my, I wore all of my strengths and weaknesses on my sleeve. <laughs> all right. I was transparent about all of that. And every team member did too, because my teammates needed to understand when they could lean on me. Okay. Cause they saw my strengths and then when they expected me to lean on them because they saw my weaknesses. All right. So in a truly high performing team, we're transparent about both our strengths and our weaknesses. We can say, Hey, teammates, this is where I can shine for you. And this is where I'll need to lean on you. Um, so that when the environment is changing around that team uh, and something hits us from any angle, the person who is the closest to the problem and the most capable immediately steps up and take lead, takes lead and everybody follows. In the truly high performing team, there's it's I kind of call it it's it's well, the way I, I call it dynamic subordination in the book. You can also call it alpha swapping. OK, but it's this idea that there, that's a dynamic swap between leader and follower relationship right so so sometimes i'm the leader and sometimes i'm the follower and it really depends on the situation so just know in any team you want to create a team where the members all feel that way they're all mutually supportive of each other and you can swap in between leader and follower um whenever is needed hopefully that answers your question rich i have something to add here you know in i mean given that this is you know all uh, school uh, everybody is trying to outshine each other, right? In terms of grades and, you know, how do they learn to be team players while they're in school and, you know, really learn to work in collaboration while the education system doesn't really permit that in a lot of ways, right? You're absolutely right. And, and I think one of the, one of the things we have to remember is that, um, uh, ultimately whether, whether only one person gets an A in the class or everybody gets an A, it doesn't matter. Just because you got an A yeah. and everybody else got a B or C, it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, it, it, <clears throat> I mean, it, it matters in the sense that you'll, <clears throat> you have that on your record, excuse me. <clears throat> um, but, um, but it doesn't matter if all of you get an A, right? And oftentimes if you choose to work together and work as a team, then all of you can get great grades together. And it's a much more rewarding process. It's a much more um, uh, uh, productive process. And guess what? You make some great friends along the way. You know, you, you develop right. great relationships versus fighting each other and, and trying to compete for something that doesn't exist, right? They, it does, you know, every, there's, there's plenty of grades out there. Everybody can get an A. There's plenty of A's out there to give, right? It's all on us to just, just earn it. So if we work together and help each other, we develop great relationships um, and friendships that last forever, by the way. And by the way, friendships that last so long that none of you will be able to remember uh, what grade you got anyway. <laughs> yeah, this is true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 20. I, I, I can't even remember what grades I got in, in school. Okay, I can't even remember that, right? It doesn't matter. But I do still have friends from school. Okay, right. so, so work on, uh, you know, be empowered and work on the relationships um, that help can help you get there because those will be what last. Wow, thanks, Rich. Uh, Ishan Shetty, I think you have a question. Your hand is raised. Yes. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Ishan from India. Uh, first, of all, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, so my question was mainly related to choices. Uh, as you spoke about, you made choices between Navy SEAL and becoming a pilot or getting into the Air Force. Uh, um, usually in situations under high pressure, it may become very difficult to make choices. So, I mean, how did the Navy SEAL help you in acquiring uh, any choice making attributes or techniques you can use in such at such situations? Yes, great question. 
Um, so let's go back to let's go back to our our fear response physiologically. But what happens when we have our fear response is that oftentimes we start the amygdala starts to take over, and sometimes you get into what's called amygdala hijack. Okay, what that means is that that fight or flight begins to happen without us <laughs> without us being able to think through it. Okay, our conscious our conscious mind, our frontal lobe, actually comes a little bit offline, sometimes totally offline, and we're just acting without thinking. That's not where we want to be in stressful, challenging situations. The best place to be in terms of decision making in stressful, challenging situations uh, is the ability to consciously think through a problem and make choices. Okay. So that's number one. We want to make sure how do so how do we begin to bring our conscious mind back online so we can make decisions and think logically through. So now we have to just kind of understand what what fear actually is okay fear is a combination of two things all right it's a combination of anxiety plus uncertainty okay you can have one without the other and it's not necessarily fear fear doesn't necessarily show up right you can be anxious but not uncertain this might be hey i i'm taking a test next week i'm pretty well prepared i know the material i think i'm going to do fine um i'm just a little anxious all right i'm not uncertain because i know the test and things so i'm just anxious all right um you can be uncertain without being anxious. Um, well, that's you know at least in the in the U.S. you know or you know in in the um, in the Christian faith that's every kid on Christmas Eve. Okay, you know you're 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 uncertain but not anxious. Okay, when you start to have both, that's when fear starts to show up. You can actually begin to buy down fear by addressing either one of those or both. Okay. Anxiety, we have to recognize, is an internal response, okay, and can be managed internally, all right? So in other words, you can do things like breathing, like proper breathing exercises that help take you out of a sympathetic response into a parasympathetic, help bring that amygdala response down so that you can start consciously thinking. That, that probably needs to be step number one. You can do that through some breathing techniques. You can do that through some visual techniques. You can do that through visualization. You can do that through gratitude if you have time, okay? But anything that helps calm you and and brings that uh, brings that amygdala uh, response down so you can get your conscious mind online. Once your conscious mind com become comes online, you can begin to manage or buy down the uncertainty. Now we have to recognize uncertainty is external. All right, that's the environment changing without our control. So very difficult to <laughs> to 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 affect that. Other than we start asking the right questions. Okay, the Navy SEALs call this controlling your three foot world. All right, what what that means is in an environment of uncertainty, challenge, and stress you first ask yourself, okay, what about this environment do I understand? All right, and begin to get that list in your head. And then from that list, you say, okay, what can I control right now? What can I focus on and control right now? Now, sometimes that answer is gonna be, well, I can, I can, I can take 10 steps or I can move to the next meal. Sometimes it's like, hey, all I got is I can take one step or I can count to 10, okay? Whatever that control is, is up to you. But as soon as you take control, focus and do that and make that step, you get a dopamine reward, right? What does that mean? That means you can do it again. That means your brain is, you're, 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 you're hacking your physiology so you can continue to do that. So, so in deep challenge, uncertainty, and stress, the idea is to do what I call chunk uncertainty, manage your anxiety, chunk uncertainty, and take one step at a time and make those steps as long or as short as you need to so that you eventually move through the problem. Does that help? Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, okay, Sean. Great. Thanks a lot. Okay, so we have next, uh, let me see, Neha Kalko. Yeah, hi, my name is Neha Kalko and I study in Dubai. And my question for you is, what advice would you give yourself when you were in our position? So in like high school? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a good one. It is a good one. Um, okay, the first, uh, the first bit of advice is ask better questions. Okay, do you can do that? You can do that now. All right, start doing that. Focus on uh, empowering questions versus disempowering questions. Uh, the second bit of advice is, and I've already said this too. Um, don't don't let other people's um, pinholes, pinhole um, pictures, or 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 images of their lives um, influence. Or, 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 or make you feel self-conscious about your life, okay? Uh, i.e. social media, i.e. movies. We don't need to compare ourselves to anybody else. The third one, which is really important, is uh, something I say all the time and I've, I, I've tried to live and gotten better at. Um, be resolute in your outcome, but be flexible in the approach, 
Okay, what does that mean? It means if you have a goal, right, be resolute in that goal. I want to do this, accomplish this, be this, okay? And then it's going to be likely that you have some thoughts on how that's going to map out, the pathway to that goal, okay? However, it's entirely likely that that pathway won't turn out the way you think it's going to turn out, <laughs> okay? It's going to change along the way, all right? This is where rock climbers can teach us a lot, okay? So rock climbers, and I don't climb rocks. I don't climb cliffs because I, I, I'm afraid of heights, right? So I don't, do, I don't climb. But the climber will stand at the base of a cliff or a mountain and look at the top and say, okay, the top is my outcome. That's my, that's my outcome. Then they'll probably look at that, 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 the face of that rock and start to kind of think, okay, I can probably do this. I could probably go up this way. They'll kind of get a, a map, a, a general map. Then they'll start climbing. But what happens when they start climbing is they're going to be looking for handholds and footholds so that they can go. And, and, and it's very likely, and it happens often, in fact, all the time, where that pathway that they thought they were going to do changes because when they, when they get to the next, when they get to the, what they thought was a good foothold or handhold, that's not going to be, so they have to, they're going to find another one, okay? What also happens often is that sometimes the best handhold or foothold is actually like over to the right and down. Okay, they actually have to move down and away from their outcome to find a better handhold or foothold. Okay, what does that tell us? That means sometimes in the conduct of your goal, it will feel like you're moving away from it. Okay, but you're you have to understand you're you're doing that so that you can find a better pathway up. Okay, this is what it means to be resolute in the outcome, be flexible in the approach. Um, any time you're climbing a hill or a mountain or whatever, sometimes because of your positioning on that rock, you're going to lose sight of the top. Okay. It's just going to be blocked by another rock. It's going to be down in a valley, whatever. Okay. That doesn't mean you're not on the way. <laughs> okay. Keep moving towards that way. Keep moving towards that outcome. So those are the three pieces of advice I'd, I'd give to you all at your age and, and work through that. Thanks, Rich. I hope that is helpful, Neha. Yeah, it was. Thank you. What school do you go to? I don't see a school name here. Oh, Dwight School, Dubai. Okay, thanks, thanks, Neha. Uh, Dipon Roy, I think he's ready with his mic to ask a question. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Dipon Roy. Like, I'm from Southby School, Bangladesh. And the question that I have is like, uh, in your book, at the beginning, you like use three examples, and all three are about people. Like, first one was a, a guy who got lost in China, right? Mm -hmm. But he was eventually find a way back home third one is about a pandemic we will eventually the pandemic will eventually end mm -hmm. what about the things that we don't know what about the things that we are certain that it won't end what will we do yeah yeah um the, the it's a great question because yes that's it's almost uh what i would call um interminable right uh, uncertainty you just don't know you don't know when the end's going to happen yeah, um and there's not much we can do what I tell you what not to do is don't focus on the end. <laughs> okay, because because you can't because if you try to focus on something you can't control, it'll just add to your stress. This is where it's really important to focus on the moment and focus on controlling what you can control. Um, because the outcome may not be clear. Um, and the end may not be clear. And the best we can do is to is to control what we can control in the moment and move positively in a positive direction, whatever that means for us. I mean, we can we can use someone who's had cancer as a as an example of this and i i have i have i have several friends who've gone through cancer and survived and they will tell me they've told me and they will tell anybody that you know it's a highly highly uncertain outcome they don't know if they're gonna survive they don't know what's gonna happen and all they can do is control and understand and and um and feel good about the moment they're in and make smaller goals make smaller steps um, towards what they believe is a productive outcome. So, um, so in in these situations where you are uncertain of the outcome, or we don't know how long it's going to last, it's even more important to take smaller steps and where you can make sure you're recovering. Okay, because recovery is a huge part of this process. What is recovery? Well, recovery is the our ability to physiologically rest. Okay, um, to to come offline and get our parasympathetic uh, parasympathetic set parasympathetic system um, online so we can rest and recover and grow, okay? The number one way we do this is sleep as human beings, okay? So do not cheat yourself from good sleep, okay? That's number one. But the other way we can do this is just find those things in our lives that bring us joy, peace, and relaxation. That could, it could mean different things for anybody, okay? For, you know, it could be reading a book, it could be meditating, it could be praying, it could be um, hanging out with friends uh, or family. 
it could be exercising. I, I here in Virginia, I go for runs in the woods by myself and I don't time myself and I don't listen to music. I just enjoy nature and, and jog. And that's very, um, uh, rehabilitating for me. Okay. So, uh, so make sure that when you're in these situations where you don't know the outcome, you don't know the end, um, focus on those things you can control, make those, make those small wins, and then make sure you're recovering where you can. So you're, you're recharging your system and you're not, your, your body is not falling into entropy. So hopefully that, hopefully that helps. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks Rich. Thanks upon. I think Ari has another question. Uh, Ari, you want to go with your question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. First of all, sorry for not uh, introducing myself earlier. My name is Ari. I'm a 10th grade student from Turkey. And uh, I was going to ask you, Navy was an uncertainty for you and life and uh, college and other things is an uncertainty for me. And I don't know uh, which attributes will help me in reaching my aim. Uh, so what what I was trying to ask is uh, if the attributes that I have, if I found find out in the way uh, of my aim that those are not enough and my engine isn't uh, designed uh, for that specific aim and my, my unique abilities uh, doesn't uh, complete the requirements of uh, achieving my aim, then should I give up or should I fight further to make sure uh, I gain other abil abilities and reach my aim? Like, uh, is it more important to choose the aim which is uh, appropriate uh, with my uh, attributes or mm -hmm. should I uh, change and improve my attributes to reach my aim? Yeah, it's a, what, a, what a wonderful question. Um, so yeah, I, I would never encourage anybody to give up on a goal. Okay. Uh, we are as human beings, all highly adaptable. Okay. Which means we can make any change we want to. Um, so, so pick your goal, pick the, and, but here's the thing. When you pick your goal, try to make sure it is truly your goal. Okay. It's not someone else's goal. It's not, um, it's not, uh, something you saw in a movie or what, or it, it's not someone, you know, influencing you in a way that's not you. Okay. So make sure it's something that you are passionate about. Um, and then, yes, as you as you go down that road now, it's it's highly likely that if you pick something, if your goal is something that you're really interested and passionate about, it's highly likely that that most of your attributes are aligned with that. <laughs> OK, um, which is the good news. So that's uh, now there might be a couple attributes, however, that you say, hey, you know, I'm a little bit low on this and I could use more to achieve to better achieve this goal. And that's perfectly OK. We can all develop our attributes. Listen, I don't like heights. OK, I hate heights. And I was a Navy SEAL. I did thousands of skydive. I've jumped out of airplanes thousands of times, and I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> okay, which means I had to conquer. I had to get over that. I, I, I never got over it, but I had to conquer it. I had to move through that so that I could be a Navy SEAL. Okay, um, there are Navy SEALs who don't like being underwater. Just think about that for a second. Navy SEALs whose primary job is to scuba dive underwater don't like being underwater. Okay, they had to conquer that. They had to basically get over that. So, so you can absolutely take some of those attributes that you are a little bit, you might be a little bit lower on and develop those to achieve and accomplish whatever you want to achieve. Just know that it's going to be uncomfortable a little bit and you're going to have to push through some fear and discomfort, but that's okay too, because you're going to learn when you do that. All right. So, so yeah, be resolute in your outcome, understand. And the other thing about understanding your own engine with the power of understanding your own engine is you will be able to then say, Oh, cool. Okay. I'm good on all these attributes. I don't have to really wor worry about those. And now I can isolate the one or two, that I can work on to really hyper achieve whatever you want to achieve. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, Rich. Thanks, okay. thanks, Ari. Uh, Louis, Lu Louisa, would you go next? Um, if you wanted to change anything about your book, what would it be? Mm, that's, a, hmm. yeah, that's a good one. Have Boy, it's only been out. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's only been out for a few months. I don't know. Um, uh, there's probably, well, you know, it's interesting. I would say this, um, when you, you write the book and then you start talking about the book, uh, the, I, I've been able to come up with, uh, more distinctions and some deeper thoughts about some of the concepts, some of the, some of the chapters from the concepts. So, so I would say, I would say, um, at least at this point, and I, you have to ask me in another year or so once the book's been out, but um, at least at this point, there's probably a few things that as I've talked about the book, I, I've said 
And I said, you know what, that's, that's a distinction that I never thought of while I was writing it. And it would have been cool if I had put that in the book. So, so I think that's probably the best I can do right now, but, um, but let's make sure we at, we, we ask that question again in another year or so. <laughs> Thanks, Lucia. Okay, who do we have next? Uh, let's see who I have not asked a question. John Carlo. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so, hey, Rich. Um, I just, on the record, I just want to say that as I did my research on you, I just want to say that I have the utmost respect for you and admiration. And oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and so, my question is I remember, aside from looking through your first chapter of the book, which, by the way, was great. I read, I watched your interviews with Lewis House and Rich Roll, and you said something about how you can't learn attributes. So if you can't if you can't be taught attributes, what are other ways you can develop attributes? And in, in addition to that, you think it's better that you team up with other people who have attributes that you lack in? Yeah. Um, so, okay. That's a great question. I'm going to answer the second part first. The answer to the second part is yes, absolutely. That's what, that's what great teams are. They are a collection. They're a, they are a, um, a, 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 a conjunction of attributes that make sense together and high performing teams have polarities, right? So my, I, my wife and I have been married for 20 years. Um, and you know, over 20 years, I think now, anyway, I am an inherently patient person. I'm just, I'm just that way. My wife is inherently impatient. Okay. That has worked beautifully for us in our marriage and with our kids, because when the, when the environment has required patience, I've stepped up and taken lead. Okay. And when the environment has required impatience, she's stepped up and taken lead. Okay. So that's how that works on a team. All right. When it comes to, um, attributes uh, and learning and developing attributes, we just have to, you can, like I just said, you can develop attributes. You just have to think of them a little bit differently. Okay. A quick, um, a quick test as to uh, determine uh, an attribute or a, uh, whether it's an attribute or a skill would be to ask this question, okay? Can I, can I teach it or can it be taught? Okay, if the answer is yes, it's likely a skill. If the answer is no, it's likely an attribute. Here's an example, John. John, if you said, hey, Rich, I'd love to, I'd love to learn how to shoot a gun and hit a bullseye, okay? I could take you out to a range and within two hours teach you how to do that. Okay. That's a skill. Okay. But John, if you said, Hey, Rich, I want to learn, I want to develop my adaptability. Okay. I can't teach you a class on adaptability. All right. That's going to take you deciding to do that. Okay. Um, so in the, in the case of these attributes, you can, you can learn. I, I usually, you know, again, I'm into semantics. So I, I like to use the, I like to, to try to use specific terminology. I would say we can develop attributes, not so much learn them, but develop attributes because we already have them. So how do we develop them? If you're low on one, like I could just describe, you can do that. It's just going to take self-motivation, self-direction, and a willingness for you to step into environments of discomfort and uncertainty so that you can, you can develop that. But you can absolutely do that. You just can't do it the same way as a skill. You also don't necessarily need to learn or develop all the attributes, okay? Depending on what you want to do and depending on your specific pathway or niche or goal, there might be some attributes you don't need to develop, right? The, the, the stand-up comic, I love stand-up comics. I, I think they're awesome. I think they're the most, you know, they're brilliant and they do good in the world because laughing is so great. But the stand-up comic doesn't need, for example, a lot, of, a lot of empathy, okay, as an attribute. In fact, too much empathy for the stand-up comic might be bad, right? Because how are you supposed to find funny in a funeral if you have too much empathy, okay? So, so too much empathy for stand-up comic. So, so that stand-up comic can say, well, I'm low on empathy, but that's actually, that's fine. I don't need to hyper-develop that. Whereas a nurse, for example, needs to probably develop empathy if they're, if they're low on that, right? So, so you have to ask yourself, okay, in the conduct of my uh, pathway for my goal, kind of like what Ari was kind of talking about, as I figure out what that, what those attributes are that are required, where do I stand on them? There are some you're going to say, mm, I don't really need any of that. I, mean, I don't need, I don't need to develop that because it's not going to be in the conduct of my goal. And there are going to be others that they say, okay, yes, I actually need to develop that if I want to achieve this. So, so make sure you understand that you don't need to develop all of them. You just need to figure out the ones you want to develop. And yes, you can definitely, um, uh, uh, what not cheat the system, but, but, um, but speed up the, the process or speed up the system by being on a team that supports those attributes if you're a little bit lower on them. All right, thank you, Rich. Justin, could you introduce yourself quickly since I don't see your school name? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Joy and I'm from NGIS. 
my question is, why did you decide to kind of share these attributes or teach us about these attributes? Yeah, thank you, Joy. Um, the uh, the reason is because I'm 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 really fascinated with human potential, <clears throat> and I'm really uh, and 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 the idea of discovery and evolution and um, and kind of forward movement excites me a great deal, and um, and the only way we can do that is if we all start to figure out our own engines and figure out what we can contribute. Um, I, you know, there's only so much I can contribute, you know, I, you know, I'm not going to help anybody, you know, with interstellar, interstellar space travel, you know, my sons might, because they're interested in that stuff. But, but so, so what I, what I want to do is the, to the extent to which I can take my experience and give it to give the lessons to other people so that they can then take that and really start moving towards their potential that really excites me and i think for me it's the, the part of that process is understanding ourselves understanding our behavior understanding our engines and part one of that is uh, is this idea of attributes what are those what are those elemental things that cause us to behave the way we behave and if we can start to identify those and know those then we can more deliberately uh start to uh, explore our potential so that's probably uh, the, the reason why Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Joy. Uh, Aditya Tandon? Yeah, hello. I'm Aditya from India. Uh, so I would like to ask you, how can one, um, like, yeah, how can one focus on self-improvement? What are the tips you can, can you say, share some tips with us, like how to develop an attribute other than asking questions? Yeah. Um, well, the, 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 the first step in self-improvement is to understand um, what you'd like to improve, okay? Uh, because, because again, I think that's also sometimes incorrectly influenced by other factors, okay? Um, there are a lot of other people out there oftentimes chirping in our ears telling us how we need to be or how we need to improve or what we need to be, okay? Um, and uh, very little of that matters. <laughs> what matters is what we what we believe, okay? And so what we need to do is we need to ask ourselves, um, how should we improve? But that shouldn't be the first question we ask. The first question we ask should be, how am I great? You know, what, what, are, what are the great things about me? And what are my unique capabilities and strengths and qualities? Because that's the better question. Um, because from there, then we can say, oh, cool, okay. Um, you know, I'm pretty darn good at uh, at resilience or at empathy or at uh, at you know, you know, situational awareness. Um, now I want to be better at that. Okay, and then I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go and develop that. I'm gonna be I'm gonna I'm gonna self improve on that. Okay, um, so so that's part one is understand what we want to improve. Um, in terms of some tips and tools on how to do it, it's a really interesting question. It's a difficult one because it's a very subjective process. Okay. Um, I can't tell other people necessarily what they need to do to improve a specific quality. First, I don't, I'd have to say, I'd have to ask, okay, what, what do you want to improve? Um, but, but the, but the process of self-improvement is going to involve always does a, a deep process of introspection. So, so if I were to give you one of the most important tools in self-improvement, it's first, uh, introspection. Okay you know, looking into ourselves, sitting with our own selves, sitting inside of our head and asking ourselves some questions. Okay. And, and, and examining our, our stuff. So often nowadays, we're not, we're not, we're not given the time or space to do that. And even when we have the time or space to do that, we don't let ourselves do it. Why? Well, because all of us have, you know, mobile phones. Okay. You know, these things distract us every single moment of every single day if we let them all right um and and what it does is it 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 it, it in some cases is great i mean I, I can i can watch netflix anywhere okay but but that's the problem as well because i can watch netflix anywhere you know and and it it creates this um this sometimes unconscious demand to be entertained by something else all the time okay we have to i believe to really get into ourselves just put down 
the distractions once in a while and just start noticing the things around us and then start getting into our head a little bit and thinking and 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 meditating and and by meditating i mean just really thinking about things um i when i was a kid we used to go on vacations uh and so we used to drive we had four kids in our in our uh family so my dad we weren't flying anywhere we were driving okay so we drive for 18 20 hours to go visit family or whatever okay well, back then we didn't have CDs, we didn't have phones, we didn't have Walkmans, okay? We had nothing, okay? I would sit in that car for hours upon hours and just look out the window, just stare out the window. And I would just think about things and I would imagine and I would just be in my head. I mean, that has that has translated, that tra traveled with me so that even when I'm on an airplane today, like I, as long as I have window seat, I can sit and look out the window and just think. I enjoy doing that. I don't need to be watching a movie all the time. I don't need to be listening to music. I don't need to be entertained. Okay. Now there's nothing wrong with being entertained and, and kind of escaping. Okay. But just know self-improvement is about not escaping, you know, as uh, once in a while, uh, throwing away those or putting aside those things that allow us to escape ourselves and getting into ourselves, okay? Because once you get into yourself, you're gonna find that there's some great stuff in there, okay? And there's, yeah, there's some things you're gonna to wanna to improve, but it's gonna be from a positive aspect versus a negative one, okay? So start, all of, I would I would offer this, I guess this, I guess this could be the fourth piece of advice, um, introspect more, okay? Get into your head, allow yourself to, to get into your head more often and, th and put away all those distractions and just be inside your head, ask yourself questions, you know, turn over ideas, um, notice things in our environments, you know, uh, and just enjoy the now and the presence. And that will help in that process. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Aditya. Thanks, Rich. And Aditya, you know, I think the other thing I have learned on self-improvement, working with so many students um, now, and especially in the high school, is, you know, mm -hmm. develop a growth mindset, which really means that pick up something new that you want to do every week. Um, you know, it could be as simple as cooking a dish you've never done, like, you know, pick up a dish in South Korea, for example, and say, I'm going to do that today. It, it wires your brain to move out of its comfort zone and start discovering something new. And similarly, if you learn a new language or, you know, as Rich said, you pick up like a skill that you want to do, you know, you're just going to go parasailing, you know, for example, and say that, okay, I'm going to going to do that. But, you know, you can pick up very small things to do every week. You know, say if you jog for one kilometer, you say today, I'm going to start jogging for two kilometers. It pushes boundaries. And I think self-improvement is really linked to how much you can push yourself to do new things, because it's very easy for the human mind to drift into a comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And it is only we keep pushing it out is when we improve because that's when we discover new things. And that's where you start figuring out that, oh my God, you know, really, I, I enjoyed this, right? You could pick up a book that is very tough to read and say, um, you know, but I'm going to just do it. I'm just going to sit this weekend and finish the book. When I picked up Rich's book, I, I actually like literally finished it over a weekend. And that's because I just felt like I just wanted to read more. And the way he talks, spoke about grit and, you know, resilience and courage. So develop a growth mindset. And that would lead to anything that you want to improve. Totally agree. <laughs> Thanks, Aditya. Okay, who's coming next? Let's see. We've done Aditya. Who's left? Uh, Sadat, uh, Sadat, would you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hi. Hi. I am from, I'm Sadat. I'm from Bangladesh. Hi. And one thing I noticed in your book is how you talked about um, narcissism. So normally, and in our world, it's considered a bad thing, right? However, you promoted it in a way. So what I would like to ask is, how do we draw the, um, the fine line between being proud of oneself and then being overconfident and just throwing everything out of the window and being complacent? Yeah. How do we differentiate that? Yeah, thank you, Sadat, for bringing that up. It's an important thing that I want to make sure we talk about because um, I... I don't want to promote it <laughs> as much as I want to just I, um, I, sometimes I want to explain it and describe it. So let's just t take that a uh, little bit piece by piece. Um, uh, narcissism is the desire to stand out, to be recognized, to be special, to be adored. OK, that's it's 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 certainly a personality. There's a personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, which the um, the psychological uh, manual or Bible, uh, the, P the DSM-5 will describe nine characteristics uh, that if you have five or more of, 
you you technically have the disorder. Okay. Now, very few people technically have the disorder. It's usually about one percent. However, if you were if you read those those characteristics, which I did, you start to say to yourself, what like I did, I said, well, I I don't necessarily have that, but there are pieces of that that I I that I think I've had before, right? It doesn't. It didn't necessarily. When I read it, it wasn't like, oh yeah, no, 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 right? It, there was like, oh, actually, that that's a little. That makes a little bit of sense. So I had to really th think about it in a in a in a different way. And then when I asked myself, okay, well, why did I become a Navy SEAL in the first place? You know, I was 22 years old. Of course, I was patriotic. Of course, I was interested in serving my country. But ultimately, it was also because I wanted to see if I could do something that very few people could do. I wanted to be special. I wanted to kind of stand out a little bit, you know, in that way, um, you know, and and there's nothing wrong with that, right? And, and when I asked my friends, they would say the same thing, right? So I had to break it down to kind of the neuroscience, all right? When we are infants and we are getting paid attention to and adored and loved by, by our parents or other people, um, we are getting a hit of three separate chemicals, two neurotransmitters and one, uh, hormone, okay, dopamine, which is we we already talked about. This feels great. A neurotransmitter called serotonin, which is you know kind of a it, it does it does many things, but it also kind of at the sense of safety and comfort and bonding. Um, and then oxytocin, which is known as the love hormone. Okay, we're getting all three of those when we're getting paid attention to an adult. Okay, it feels great. This doesn't change when we're adults. <laughs> okay, when we're getting paid attention to an adult as adults, we're getting that same biological hit. So it feels great to be that to be paid attention to every one of us as human beings, at least once in our lives, usually more wants to be at some point adored, loved, uh, made to feel special, things like that. It's a very natural human thing, right? These are the seeds of narcissism. This is why and how it's a driving uh, attribute because, you know, this is how someone starts to set those audacious goals, those audacious outcomes. I mean, be a Navy SEAL, be an author, be a surgeon, be an astronaut. Okay, these are these are audacious goals that are set in part because someone wants to stand out. They want to feel special. They want to feel unique. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think as humans, we need to embrace that versus ignore that it's there altogether. Okay, so 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 idea one is let's embrace those elements of narcissism. All right, and because they can be incredible drivers. Now, here's the warning. It comes with a pretty pretty big warning. It's, you know, narcissism at its extreme is bad. We all know that, okay? And it's also invisible to ourselves. It's like a vampire staring in the mirror. It's very hard to see in ourselves, okay? This is why you see narcissists out there and like how the heck do they not know what they're doing? It's because they, it's impossible to see in themselves, okay? The way we inoculate ourselves from getting to that level is we surround ourselves with people who we love and who we trust and who will always give us the, the honest truth when we start getting out ahead of ourselves or getting a big head, okay? My wife has done this for me for our whole marriage. My teammates did this for me, my family. People who will say, hey, Rich, uh, bring it back a little bit. You're getting a little bit, of, you know, you're, you're getting a big head, okay? You know, fortunately that didn't happen very often, but, you, but if you surround yourself with people who give you the honest truth, um, you will inoculate yourself. Now you can tell why this works because true narcissists don't surround themselves with those type of people. True narcissists surround themselves with sycophants and people who constantly are feeding their ego and telling them how great they are, okay? And oftentimes though, that, that group switches out quite a bit because it's very hard to be sycophantic for that long. And then as soon as that person leaves, they're usually enemy number one for that actually for that person. So, so you can tell um, narcissists oftentimes by the groups they surround themselves with, if they're always the center of tension, they can't, they can't not be. Um, but we certainly in ourselves, we want to make sure that we're surrounding ourselves with people that we are not always the center of tension and they're, they're giving us the hard truths when we need to, and there's a mutual, uh, love and respect. Okay. So, so the idea is to embrace the humanness of narcissism. Um, and then, you know, confidence is different. I mean, confidence is, is, is this idea that I know I can do it regardless of what happens. I know I'll push through. It may not be pretty. Okay. It might be ugly and dirty and gritty, but I can do it. That's confidence. Okay. And it's different. It's different than arrogance, for example. Uh, arrogance is so confidence. The difference is confidence is I know I can do it. And arrogance is I'm better than you. Confidence is internally focused. Arrogance is externally expressed. Okay. Arrogance is almost always, and I would offer to say always the result of some insecurity somewhere. 
Okay. Some, if a person is displaying arrogance, it's guaranteed that they are insecure about something. And that's why they're being arrogant. Okay. It's arrogance is in fact, a lack of confidence in some, in some venues. So, uh, so they're a little bit different. Confidence is different a little bit than narcissism. Narcissism is this desire to stand out, to be recognized and adored. And I'm saying, let's make sure as humans, we're embracing that to a healthy degree to, to allow us to set audacious goals. And then confidence is, Hey, I know I can do this regardless of what happens. So hopefully that answers your question. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Adat. Uh, Tasneema, uh, you go next. Yeah. Hi. Uh, this is Tasneema Puma, and I'm from the Khan School, Dhaka. It's in Bangladesh. Uh, I had a question. I was uh, in your website, and it's very impressive. I have to say, starting from the book to, and the uh, you know the assessment that I uh, came onto, and the assessment. Uh, I just want to talk about that. Uh, what challenges did you uh, face while making the questionnaire or of the assessment? Because uh, every person, as you said, is unique. So maybe uh, not uh, all of the questions apply to one person. So just that, as in what challenges did you come across while making that? Yeah, it was a very interesting process. Um, so thank you for the question. The, the first challenge is almost exactly what you just inferred in that, um, we, you know, because attributes are subjective, not everybody is going to feel or experience the same thing with every scenario. So our first idea when we were putting it together was, hey, we should we should generate questions that put people in scenarios so that they can they can kind of examine what their attributes what attributes they might have or where they might fall. The problem with that, like you just said, is that experiences people experience different things uh, differently, right? You know, so one I'm I'm afraid of heights, but other people love heights, right? So so it it would have it would have been near impossible to create so many different scenarios that applied to so many different people. So what we had to do instead was we had to generate more simple questions that allowed some introspection for the user. So, so the, so the questions are designed in a way to get you the, the taker to really think about you and project yourself into some experiences to better answer the question. So that's number one, it's designed really to help you think about yourself. That's, that's, uh, that's really the ultimate goal of the assessment is to get you to think about yourself a little bit more. And the other thing I'll tell you about the assessment for those of you, I know, I know you took it, but if anybody else who takes it is that all it really is is a snapshot. Okay. Because what we had to do is when we designed it, we then, we then burst it out to about a thousand or more people around the world and got data back. Okay. So that when you get your assessment results, it's going to give you a number um, on each attribute, a, a, a rating scale. Okay, all that scale, all that rating is, is as compared to that thousand people. All right. So, so you know, the my score on on um, perseverance is <clears throat> only as compared to this thousand people. Now we're gonna <clears throat> right now we're working on we've had over ten thousand people take it. So now we're, we're working on getting that data involved too. But even even with ten thousand people, it's still gonna be a comparison. All right. So what that tells you is when you look at your results, you have to say, okay, does this result make sense to me based on my my own experience and my own um, performance when I think back uh, into in times of uncertainty? Was am I am I a level am I actually a level three on perseverance or does this, it, does this, does this not really match me? So, um, so definitely if you take the assessment, think of it as a snapshot, this is where I stand as compared to a bunch of people and then look at it as a tool that allows you to, to, to further introspect on yourself versus this is who you are and what your score is. And that's, that's it. <laughs> Hopefully that answers your question. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, thanks Nima. Uh, Kushi, you go next. Thank you. So, um, hi, I'm Kushi Vib Mehta, and I am from Euro School Eroli in Mumbai. So, I wanted to know, I when I was reading about your profile, I read that you've completed more than 13 overseas deployments, and 11 of which were at, I mean, were in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, can you tell us a little bit about your experience and, you know, how it is, um, any insights that you've learned from that, things you've learned from that? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's uh, the... Uh, the, I guess the biggest lesson uh, is that war is bad no matter what. Okay, um, and um, and I think that a lot of us, certainly me included, are, and this might be a surprise to people, are more pacifists than you think. You know, because we've seen and we understand the effects of war on everybody, on on the on the people in the country that is being conducted, on the soldiers, on both sides, uh, the civilians. 
um, the people at the home front, right? It's, it's just bad. It should be always, always very, very carefully thought through prior to, um, prior to being conducted. And I'm not saying there are some people, there's some bad people out there who, who, you know, need to be taken uh, away, <laughs> right? Um, however, it needs to be very, very well thought through. And so I think that's the biggest lesson. I mean, the other thing is, you know, it was a very, you know, I, you know, I was over in the Middle East so much, I spent so much time and I really loved the area and I loved the people. Um, and I really developed a, a, a great fondness of, of that part of the world. Uh, and so for me, uh, despite the, I guess, the, the situation that was around me, I felt, uh, I felt quite enamored um, with, with that region. You know, now my mom, my mom was born in Egypt. So I have, I have a little bit of, you know, kind of that Middle Eastern blood and, she, you know, she speaks Arabic. And, and so we have, you know, my mom calls us mutts because we're from like, we're Greek, we're Italian. We have like, you know, we're, we're, we have so many different, you know, uh, backgrounds in our, in our blood, which is great because, because mutts live a long time. So, <laughs> so the, the more, the more diversity you can have in yourself, the better I got off, I guess. Um, but, uh, but I really enjoyed and loved the people, the area. I was able to see a culture that I, uh, would not have previously seen. And of course, I was in the Middle East even before the war. I was, I was out there. So I was there for, for a long time. Um, but here's, but, but I guess the, I guess the last lesson I'll, I'll, I'll share with you all, and it's not gonna be a surprise to you, is that all of us are, we're just all human beings who just want to do, do, do right by ourselves and our families. That's all we want. That's all any human being wants, no matter where you go, um, no matter what, uh, you know, no matter what kind of, area of the world, no matter what ideology, at the end of the day, you know, pretty much most human beings just want to live a, a good life, do well by their families, uh, have well being and and comforts. And, uh, and it's why, you know, things like war should be very, very carefully thought through because um, that you know, typically war uh, hurts that, <laughs> that objective for for most people. So, so those are some of the lessons I'll, I, I would, I would pass. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Kushi. Arjun? Yeah, uh, there is a internet connection in your campus. So, hello, my name is Arjun. I study in Europe School, which is in India. So, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yeah, I got you. Yeah. If it's easier, you can also type your question in the chat. Yeah, that actually, would, that your, your voice is like a microphone. Arjun, why don't you type your question in the okay, chat yeah, yeah. and uh, we'll answer that. I think that's better. Meanwhile, Rich, as you know, Arjun's typing his question, you know, I would really want you to tell the students, you know, some things that they could do, uh, you know, while they're in school to trigger positive questions, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what are some triggers to kind of come up? Because I think what I realize with a lot of these students right now, even in the room, is they actually struggle to ask questions, right? So. Mm -hmm. How does one give them some trigger questions for their mind to start thinking in a questioning manner rather than taking what's given? Yeah, I mean the the best the, the best way is to ask the question, "What's the better question right now?" That's the that's the be, the best way. Um, but you can also just uh, put positive spins on anything you're doing. I mean, I you know when we think think about schoolwork and what we're doing in in a class, um, we can ask ourselves uh, things like you know how how what are some of the attributes I'm I'm developing just by doing this work, okay? Because you are developing attributes in schoolwork as you study and things like that. You can ask yourself that question. Um, there's perseverance. There's uh, there's um, uh, there's adaptability. There's uh, situation awareness. Things like that that are being developed. Um, we can ask ourselves, you know, what uh, what are some ways this material that I'm learning is are going to is going to help me as I as I as I uh, kind of uh, move forward in, in my, in my goal in my life, you know, what are those things? Um, I love questions about, uh, you know, who, who's, who's here that can help me, who's around that, that can help me right now, you know, cause that develops relationships with people. So I think any type of, um, actively positive question, uh, is going to help and, and, and trying to put a little bit of spin on it. But, um, but certainly you can always default to what's the better question. And when you ask those questions, by the way, Give yourself to some time and space, okay? Because you're going to have a couple answers that might come up in your, you know, pop into your head right away. Write those down, you know, so they get it out of the way, and then just ask yourself, okay, what else? 
Okay, mm. what else? Okay, what else? Okay, don't let yourself off the hook with one or two. Get a good list going of, of five or ten um, because you're, you're capable of that and you'll come up with some really deep and rich stuff. So that's what I would say. Oh, that's great, Rich. Um, also, Rich, I think uh, one question that I was hearing uh, amongst the students was how to deal with fear, right? I mean, you must have dealt with so much fear as a Navy SEAL. And I think our fears are big and small. You know, it could be fear of, you know, an exam. It could be fear of, an in, you know, a lizard. Like, I'm really scared of lizards. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, you know, every like, obviously, COVID has not helped, right? It's kind of built in a lot of fears. And like, you know, when I got COVID, it was almost like the anxiety was far more than the symptoms itself. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, how do you deal with that fear? I think that is something that could be very useful as a tool at every age to know. Yeah. Um, well, well, I would, I would default back to, um, to, I think what I was uh, talking about with, um, uh, I think it was John or, or I can't remember, but, uh, but it's this idea of, of taking anxiety and uncertainty and separating those and then buying those down. Okay. When you are in a fear state, when you're, when you're afraid of something, it's because it's a combination of those two things. There's anxiety and uncertainty present in that environment. Okay. Right. So the best way to deal with that is to buy down either one or both. Okay. The anxiety we can buy down by breathing and kind of taking, you know, some physiological things, visualization or visual tools, and the uncertainty we can buy down by asking questions about the environment in terms of what can I control. Okay. Um, and then just recognize sometimes, you know, fear, um, you know, people, people kind of downplay fear. Fear is actually good, a good thing. Okay. Fear is by design to allow us as human beings to appropriately assess risk, <laughs> okay? Um, because sometimes the better choice is to run, okay? You know, <laughs> you don't, you don't want to fight a bear, okay? That's not a good <laughs> idea, all right? So, so we want to make sure that we're honoring and respecting fear to the extent right. that it's, it's allowing us to assess risk and not run into a burning building when we shouldn't be. Um, mm. uh, but oftentimes, we just have to make sure we're consciously understanding the balance because a lot of times we all can say and, and, and admit that we're, we're afraid of things that we probably shouldn't be. Um, and sometimes we're not afraid of things that we should be. <laughs> okay, so, um, so really understand fear is biological. It's by design. It's, go it's a good thing. Um, but don't, uh, don't try not to place it in, in places that it shouldn't apply. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a detriment to us achieving our goals. It should be a, a warning to not get complacent while we're achieving our goals. So that we're not falling into pitfalls, but we should be actually able to move through it and use it effectively. So let's use fear for what it is. It's a very powerful and important process in our brains, but don't abuse it. You know, that's something very interesting you've said, you know, I think all our life we've been kind of programmed to fear fear in that sense that, you know, you get scared when you have a fear, uh, but nobody has ever said to embrace it, right? In a way, what you're saying is to embrace fear and, you know, pick up a situation and say whether it's good or bad. I mean, I'm yeah. sure if there's a fire in a building, uh, you know, the fear would trigger a mechanism saying run. And, yeah. uh, but I think the fear uh, kind of triggers more scare and anxiety in us than the ability to embrace it. That's uh, that's very helpful, Rich. I'm sure students here would really benefit from that. Ari has yeah. one question. Uh, Rich, you think you have hang, time for one last question? Hang, hang on one for a second, because Arjun just, uh, he directed, he direct messaged me his question. So let me answer oh, that real quick. Okay. Um, sure. And he said, the question is, throughout your life, have you faced any criticism? And if you have, how did you deal with it? And the answer is a resounding yes. Okay, we all face criticism. Okay, and um, and so how did I deal with it? Well, first of all, it depended on where it was coming from. <laughs> okay, so that's that's number one. Um, first, first determine if the criticism is coming from a reliable uh, source or a valuable source. Okay, uh, there are certain people out there who, if they criticize me. I don't care. <laughs> okay, is it their 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 opinion of me has nothing to do with my happiness. Okay, but the criticism that actually is helpful from people who actually uh, know what they're talking about, and I want to uh, I want to hear what they say. Um, it's best if you take you know this is an attribute. Take accountability first. Okay, be accountable for that, and say, okay, wait a second, this is good stuff. Okay, I want to look at this as how it can, how how this criticism can actually help me grow. Because again, if someone's if someone's giving us criticism and they're and they're someone who we love and trust, it's probably because they want to help us. Okay, and so and not hurt us, right? So sometimes we take criticism and our immediate thought is, oh, this person wants to hurt me, you know, or you know, we, we feel we feel bad or whatever. 
But if we shift that a little bit and say, wait a second, you know, and take accountability and, and, and add some humility in there, just understanding, hey, we're not the, we're not, we, we, we might not be the experts on everything, then we can actually start learning, you know, we can say, hey, why is this important? How can I learn? Um, how can this make me better? Okay. Um, accountability is huge because what accountability allows us to do is take control. Okay. And human beings, we want control. Okay. We, we want certainty. And so if we get criticism um, by, by immediately be, being accountable for that, say, okay, I, I own that. And how can I, how can I fix that? You take control, you create certainty, and you can you can learn and move through it. So hopefully that helps, Ajana. What a great it was a great question. So yeah, I think we had one more from Ari, right? Really overshot on time. Yeah, we'll do one more. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you. I hope I'm not taking anybody's turn by asking another question, but uh, I wanted to ask. Uh, like, I don't want to wait until college, or uh, I don't want to wait for an opportunity just. Uh, to just appear uh, to improve my attributes like I want to start now uh, and I want to start uh, within my school with my friends uh, I want to be beneficial for them and I want them to be beneficial for me to for each other to empower each other to uh, become uh, better at uh, what we lack uh, so I was wondering how can we do this how can we imp empower each other uh, and uh, you partly answered this question, but as you know, school isn't actually uh, a place where uh, teamwork uh, is more essential than uh, comparing each other and uh, aspiring to be better. Like we all try to be better than each other. Uh, however, what we should actually do is try to improve each other because that's what uh, is required for a better world and for a healthier environment for each other. Uh, so how can we do that? How can we empower each other? Yeah, um, it's a wonderful question. And I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. My, my best answer to that would be to take control of, of that which you can take control of, which is you and your group of friends. Okay, so start with you and your group of friends. And, you know, and if you want, look at the book together and start talking about attributes together, because as a, as a group together, you will not only be able to start thinking about ways you can improve your attributes, but your friends may have some suggestions about your attributes for you because they know you well. You know, they say they might say, Ari, actually, you you don't think you have a lot of whatever attribute, but you actually do. And here's why, because they see it in you and you might not see it in yourself. So that that discussion amongst your uh, amongst each other can actually be enlightening for all of you as to your own internal att attributes. And then you can start as a group starting to think about uh, fun ways and creative ways where you can help each other develop each other's attributes okay but you'd also see where maybe your attributes line up you know some you know your friends one of your friends might have a lot of one attribute where you don't have a lot of that same attribute and that's why you make a great team okay so that type of discussion that kind of interaction will a strengthen your friendship and your relationships um, and b start down the path of doing positive and productive work uh, together on these attributes in you know, early on and and generate habits for yourselves so that as you get to college and as you get out of college, you will have already done this many times and you can do it with a new group of friends at college and a new group of friends, you know, outside of college. So start there, start with the people you love and trust and your friends, and I think you'll find some some great results. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Ari. Uh, Rich, sorry, with your permission, can I try Arjun one last time? He's yes, please. He's me uh, to try. Uh, now that my internet is fine, I just wanted to ask one last question. Yes, go ahead. Like when you started as a Navy SEAL commander, what were your like your fears, and how did you get better with time? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, good. The good thing about when you start in the military is you don't start as a commander. <laughs> you start you start as a as an ensign, which is the very first rank, and you increase rank, which means you're basically put in positions where you can slowly get better and better, and then slowly achieve higher ranks. Um, you know. I, it's hard to it's hard to it's hard to say what I what my fears were, but what I tried to do and I continue to try to do this um, is that I try to to constantly surround myself with people who I believe are better than me, um, because what that does is that helps me it helps me up my game right and it makes me say ooh okay. I, I need to improve so that I can I can be I can be better right and it's a healthy way it's not it's not a unhealthy comparison thing it's and it's not a self deprecating thing. It's just like, hey, this this person is really good at that. I want to aspire to do better, right? So I'm going to just hang around this person and watch and learn and be and be better. 
Uh, so if we find people like that in our lives um, who are better and are really good at things, hang around them because that because success leaves clues and you can pick up some of those clues and you can learn from them and you can grow. So that's what I'd uh, I would um, offer to you. Uh, the, uh, growth is a process. It takes time. It takes patience. It takes hard work. It takes um, it takes sometimes uh, pain and suffering. Okay, but it's all that's all part of the purpose. You can't learn how to ride a bike without falling off of it. You know, uh, a few times. Okay, you're going to get scrapes and bruises. Um, it's how we look at those scrapes and bruises uh, it, uh, it, it is what determines our success or failure. So hopefully that uh, that helped answer your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Frank. Thanks, Arjun. Finally, <laughs> thank. Yeah. I'm glad your internet was all right. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that was a very insightful uh, answer. And I think I just have, you know, as a closing question, uh, you know, I was reading uh, part of your book where, you know, you really talk about courage. And it just struck me to ask you that, you know, how does one develop more courage? Uh, mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we lose out on opportunities, lose out on moments of our life because we just don't have the courage to do it. We just don't yeah. have the courage to step up and say, hey, you know, this is what I want to do. Um, you know, for the kids here, it could be about what, course they want to study or what university they want to go to or the choices they want to make but doesn't it all lead to courage and how do we get the courage to say it to people we love you know it could be our parents it could be you know people we don't want to disappoint by putting our point of view or it could be something big it could be you know taking a big step like you know actually becoming a navy seal uh, but how does one you know cultivate that courage you know mm -hmm. year, year on year day on day you're, you're not going to like the answer. The answer is do things that scare you. <laughs> That's the answer. Um, that, you know, we, it, it, it's as simple as that. I mean, we, you know, the, if you, if you try to make it uh, a habit to do things, and I, it doesn't have to necessarily scare you, but things that make you uncomfortable, you know, things that make you a little bit anxious, a little bit stressed. If you make it a habit to step into those fears, okay, you're going to start to feel those dopamine rewards. You're going to start to get used to what that feels like, it's going to help you um, inflict and affect courage with other things as well. Okay. But again, start small. All right. If you are a naturally shy person, okay, it might mean, hey, I'm going to start, I'm going to strike up a conversation with a stranger. Okay. For some right. of us, that's like, that's terrifying. Okay. But, uh, but that is a step into our, into our fear. And that's a step into courage. And you can feel once you do that, we are, you will be physiologically rewarded with dopamine. So, so once you do that, feel that reward, make sure you pay attention to it because that's what it feels like. Um, and then take another step. But yeah, it's all about, um, it's all about practice <laughs> and, and repetition. So well, I thought you were going to have some magic mantra for me to solve for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I don't. <laughs> it just keeps like more hard work. But you're right. right. I think, you know, like I used to hate coming out and talking on the video. And when I started Learn with Leaders, you know, it's just like one conversation led to the other. And in one day I realized that I just need to step out of that comfort zone uh, because all these conversations that keep playing in my head uh, need to come out, right? And um, I think that was probably the biggest comfort zone breaking I did for myself. Uh, but you're right, like I'm really scared of heights and I've been thinking what would be like to jump off a plane, right? And yeah. it's taken me all these years, but I still don't have the courage to go ahead and do it. Uh, yeah. But uh, well, but I know, I know, listen, you don't, and, and just you have to ask yourself, is it something that I need to do as well? I mean, listen, I, I, I've, I've conquered my fear of heights in certain areas. But in other areas, I mean, I, I haven't skydived in a long time, I would still be nervous if I had to skydive again. So you're for so things that naturally scare us, it's not necessarily that we're going to get over that fear. Okay, I, I will always be uncomfortable with heights, I really will. And and even now, it's like people say, hey, would you ever bungee jump? I would never bungee jump. I have no reason to bungee jump. Okay, I've already proven myself in the realm of jumping out of airplanes. So I don't need to bungee jump. Okay. So you know, just because you're afraid of something doesn't necessarily mean you have to go do it. It I would say if 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 being afraid is holding you back from right. doing something, accomplishing something, then you want to conquer it. But if if you're afraid of lizards, well, I mean, unless you want to go be a lizard trainer, you don't need to conquer that fear. Okay. <laughs> so don't worry about it. <laughs> no, you're right. And you know, bungee jumping has a strange, you know, impact in my life because I was very young and we were in Queenstown in New Zealand, which is the highest bungee jumping at that point of time, which was like two decades ago. And I stood there at the point where I was supposed to jump and I just couldn't jump. And my brother was right in front of me and he backed out looking down and said, no, I can't do this. You know, there's a yeah. river and there are mountains on the side and like just yeah. jump. And I walked back and I, I kept keep thinking even today, what if I had jumped that day and would I have known 
what right. that felt like and you know it's kind of that regret plus you know fear feeling that mm-hmm. i developed a fear maybe i didn't have maybe i didn't have fear of heights till that day and right. i developed it because i was standing there and i saw i looked down and i just freaked out uh, right. you know and i think probably that's also you know maybe fear and courage both go in hand in hand maybe i had the courage to jump that day i would have never developed that fear right right so i'm pretty right not that i really need to conquer the height fear and go you know skydiving every day <laughs> yeah you might not need to so <laughs> but but yeah you're right you know like just going in the woods and going in the jungle for a walk would be a small fear to conquer <laughs> yeah there you go there you go so well, thank you so much rich i'd like to close i know we've really overshot by 30 minutes uh but this is this is such an exciting conversation that i just uh, you know wanted to make sure every student got a question to ask and uh, i'm really really grateful to you from the entire team at learn with leaders for taking out this time you know these are topics we don't discuss uh, in our daily lives or at school but i think these are very very important conversations to have uh, that build up build us up as human beings right i mean these are the yeah. things that make us for life that that train us to be you know ready for life in a way um and yeah. i think that is far more important than studying any subject or conquering a skill uh you're totally right and i it's such it's such a pleasure to be here to be out with all of you um and uh you know and gunjan and i have we email each other so if if any of you have follow up questions or need anything just you know hit her up and she can always ask me but um but i really wish you all the best uh just thank you for for all of your uniqueness and um and the impact you are having and will have on the world so uh, i'm grateful to all of you so thanks well, for having thank me. you and everybody could you go unmute and we could a big round of applause for rich please you can all go unmute at the same time i'm fine we'll deal with the noise <laughs>